steep rise in the cost of living and that's due to wholesale inflation which has surged to a record high of 14.5% in March. So with inflation, your immediate concern would be managing your monthly cash flow. It would seem easier to cut back on your savings, but hold on, because that could actually derail your long-term financial goals. Sit back, map your financial resources and prepare a tight budget. Of course, sticking to it might seem difficult, but you can do so by reducing discretionary expenses like buying an expensive watch or taking a trip. An expert said that savings and investments should continue at the same pace, even if that means you have to give up on a trip or two. Another way to cut down on your discretionary budget is by reducing your eating out budget. Changing to public transport or working from home could also keep you away from overshooting the budget massively. If you have not paid much attention to your expenses, now would be a good time to start. Look at your grocery list and regular expenses and check what impacted you the most. Inflation will remain a recurring issue even when you retire. And to quote an expert, it's time to invest and invest well. The real rate of interest in your fixed deposit has probably turned negative. A 5.5% annual interest on your FD against the inflation rate of 7% means that your weather is eroding. So what other ways are there? Maybe you should look into investing in stock markets, with expert advice, of course. It might seem risky, but equities tend to give higher returns in the long run, but do consult an expert. So experts are saying that to beat inflation, earn higher returns through investment in stocks. So are you ready to look in the eye of inflation and beat it? When it's the world's biggest news story, there's only one gold standard of journalism. When it's the world's biggest news story, there's only one gold standard of journalism. You are watching India Today. Presented by Ebix Cash. Har khushi ke liye kafi hai. Co-presented by Coin DCX. Your gateway to crypto. Hello and welcome to the Business Today show. I am Udayan Mukherjee. Usually on this show, we get you the big faces from Indian industry and global industry. But my guest today is actually the person who all of these business leaders reach out to when they want to do a major deal, like a merger and acquisition or a restructuring, which is quite major, because she is one of India's top corporate lawyers. Uh, so if you look back and see the big deals which have happened over the last decade or longer, whether it's the Tata's acquisition of Jaguar Land Rover or LNT Mine Tree or KN Vedanta, SoftBank buying a stake in Ola, and more recently the HDFC and HDFC Bank merger even, they all have the blueprint of AZB and partners and more specifically Zia Modi, who's managing partner and co-founder of AZB. She's absolutely at the top of her game as one of the brightest stars in the Indian legal firmament. And no coincidence that she happens to be the daughter of one of India's uh, most well-known and most loved jurist, the late Soli Sarabji. It gives me great pleasure to welcome on the show today for you uh, the one and only Zia Modi. Zia, it's a pleasure having you on and thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Then It's a pleasure. Thank you. Tell us first, is it an exciting time to be a lawyer? I'm a, a top-notch lawyer today in India because there's so much going on in the M&A landscape, foreign direct investment, and even this much spoken about judicial activism. But, in the public space. Uh, is it exciting? Look at my face. Isn't it looking exciting? I think that, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the most fascinating periods for any young lawyer to be part of the entire development of corporate m and of legal jurisprudence, uh, by being a counsel arguing in court or being a young corporate attorney sitting in on a large m a deal. I think the world has really changed from about 20 years ago, where this was not necessarily the first calling of choice. 
but now I think that uh, becoming a young lawyer and hoping to aspire and reach the top of your game is very much a possibility and a dream that many youngsters want to dream. And therefore, we are seeing a lot many youngsters join the legal profession than we saw before. So a simple answer to your question is yes. And we'll probably talk a lot about the corporate aspect of it. But, you know, I don't remember law being such a major part and parcel of public discourse as it is today. I mean, all this talk about uh, the judiciary being actually an offset to the executive. Uh, do, do you agree with all that talk about legal overreach at this point in time? Or do you think it is actually a part of the role of the judiciary uh, to become part of public life as it has become in our country today? So, you know, uh, as, as you well know, and I'm sure as you've researched, uh, there are times when there are troughs and there are peaks of what you call judicial activism. Uh, I, uh, my personal view is that uh, I welcome judicial activism. I think sometimes it can be overreaching where you have uh, courts call back the government week on week and ask them to give them uh, school reports. But other than that, I think that what keeps uh, uh, all three branches in check is the fact that they are ultimately accountable for their behavior and their uh, accountability, so to speak, to the judiciary. There are some things that would never have happened without judicial intervention. You take the writ of habeas corpus, you take the under trials being kept in prison, you take the situation in orphanages, you take so many public interest litigations, which have led to change in legislation, uh, better government behavior, and uh, a sense of wariness that if you overstep the moral line, the Supreme Court is there to come and ask you to be accountable. Now, you've worked with so many CEOs and managements over the years. Uh, I always wanted to ask you this question. Do you think Indian CEOs and Indian managements innately respect the law or are they always trying to work around it, bend it or tweak it in some way? So as always, there's no one easy answer. There are CEOs today who over the last 10 years, if you ask me, have changed and have recognized that trying to skirt or to be over cute or go too close to the edge is not productive. Because when the, when the regulator comes after you, then all this cuteness you have to answer for. And so many CEOs today actually come and ask, what is the course of conduct, which is the least risky, maybe a little risky, but they don't want to ask for the not too risky. They don't want to know that, right? So their risk appetite, if you like, has reduced, which is a change in DNA of that culture of the company and of the firm. These are larger firms that go to market, mm. that have a lot of foreign direct investment in them, that have a reputation which needs to be protected. And so I've seen this change for sure in these CEOs. Then there are, of course, the smaller companies where mm -hmm. you have a mix. There are some that still have a high risk and are willing to face perhaps regulatory intervention. And there are some that even when they are smaller, they know private equity will come and they will come at a premium if your track is good not if your track is sullied. So I'm seeing all types actually then. So what allows this the preponderance of scams uh, in the corporate uh, environment, Zia? I mean, if there is some respect for law, at least in the larger companies, why do we have so many scams? What in the ecosystem is continuing to allow it? I think, let's look at it practically, right? In any country, in any part of the world, if there is a fraud, because that's what a scam is, right? then it's because there are fraudsters, all right, people who perpetrate that behavior. And those people, if they land up in companies of uh, which are public or listed uh, or touch a lot of the ecosystem, uh, then the problem is that one bad apple starts to give the infection effect to many more that were better behaved. 
and even in america or in europe when you see the the the, the scams that hit the headlines you don't well we oughtn't to rub everybody with the same brush i think the problem here is that when a scam hits the papers or when a scam hits the regulator the problem here is that the the punishment for the scam if you like which will satisfy both the regulator and the public takes too long to deliver and therefore the suggestion is that you know it can keep going on and on and justice will not be done soon enough but i think if you ask me frankly that is also changing the regulator is now aware of the tools it has to bring people to the table and to to behave better there is much more of a fear factor than there was before and i always say fear is good uh, there's nothing wrong with fear if it helps better behavior and therefore i think that you you have the scams but i don't think there's a scam popping up every week i think the problem is when we see our scams there are large proportions and they affect public money and therefore there is a there is a sort of not again kind of thing but if you ask me in the last 5 years the relative bigger scams it's a it's an odd way of saying it have reduced mm. there's enough time to talk about all of this i want to get back to the start of your story because you started this conversation by talking about a young person as a lawyer were you always going to be a lawyer when you were young because you you were born into a very illustrious legal fold or was there something intrinsically or philosophically attractive about law as a profession which got you in no i don't think at the age of 20 25 i was uh, attracted by the philosophy of law i was actually uh, it was very exciting to see my father as a young girl uh, practice as a lawyer when i was living at home and uh, you know he was in court every day and uh, we used to have dinner together the whole family and at night you would hear all these conversations one side of the conversations with a walkie talkie phone that existed in that time and it was always frenetic energetic uh argumentative uh you know having to win uh fighting everything as a war not a skirmish and so uh, given that i also have a quite an argumentative nature it appealed immediately and uh, for me it was almost like an osmosis factor i don't think i ever wanted to do anything but the law it must have been heartbreaking to lose your father to covid last year uh, but what what really have you imbibed from him i mean was it was he just an inspiration as a young woman or are many of the things that you uh, adopt today use today are actually his his uh, impre- the impression that he left behind on you i think really the value system which he asked me to follow from the first day so i worked in uh, america for uh, nearly 5 years at a firm called baker and mckenzie in new york and came back essentially to get married and came back into another world uh you know it was dickensian almost in nature i shared the desk which was a small 4 feet 5 feet desk with uh, my senior uh we had uh, no secretary uh it was uh, sweaty and packed and full of papers and uh it was starting from scratch and uh, it was arguing in court as opposed to doing an m&a transaction that i was doing in new york and so my father was in delhi i was in bombay so we never really got to practice in the same city but you know he would always tell me that and don't forget that the ultimate person you are arguing before is the judge and that you are always an officer of the court and that your client is important but never more important than your reputation with the judge and he always used to tell me that you know if you say one thing wrong in one matter before one judge they all have lunch together you will ruin your reputation in one lunch and therefore what you were brought up with is you have to do 
the right thing. That doesn't mean you can't fight heart and soul for your client. But there's a limit beyond which you need not travel. And you ought not to travel. And your sense of self-worth and confidence and your ability to sleep at night without vexing about what you did during the day is far more important than winning that fight with the wrong means. So I've always grown up uh, to, to acknowledge clients as important, but not vitally necessary to my existence if they cross my moral compass. And I think that with those values, the clients in turn respect you because they understand that the moral compass you deliver to them is for their benefit. I mean, I'm not getting anything out of their good behavior, right? I'm just protecting them. And therefore, slowly and surely, as you grow older and fatter and wiser, people take you a little more seriously. So I think that was my one of my father's greatest lessons to me and counsel to me, that just make sure whatever you do, you're able to deliver the advice in a manner that you don't regret delivering it the next day. And what he may or may not have told you in uh, telling you that all these judges have lunch together was that maybe 99% of the judges were men. I mean, you were entering a male bastion because law was a male bastion in India and perhaps in the rest of the world. Uh, what was it like? I mean, uh, I mean, would you tell a young woman who's considering law as a profession today that things are vastly different than when you started uh, uh, this profession or got into it? So uh, it's in two buckets, then. If you ask me today, uh, if you're a practicing counsel or barrister, right, and you're a woman, even today, after so many decades, I would say it is still extremely tough. Uh, I'm not sure I can put my finger on it other than to say that it's a difficult world to break into. And as a woman, it absolutely requires extra time and commitment to show that you are as good as your peer who is a male. I remember when I was a young barrister, I used to, I'm sure, work 30% more than my male counterpart because I was capital P for paranoia. I couldn't afford to make a mistake in court because I was so conscious that I was probably the only woman who was arguing in that matter on that day. So as arguing counsel, not good at all. Uh, I think we have a long way to go. I think uh, if you had to allocate why, it would be just partly, it's very, very hard to be dancing and prancing and acting day after day uh, for eight hours a day, preparing for another five hours at night for the next day and managing to multitask as a woman everything around you without the essential infrastructure and ecosystem. As a corporate lawyer or as a non-litigating lawyer, it has become much easier for women. Not terribly easy, but much easier. And that is simply because I think that in today's world, everybody, men and women, need talent. They really need talent. And if they need talent, then women are talent. And so you can't afford to just let any bright woman drop off the landscape and just fade away from the firm without making that effort to retain and keep that incredible source of talent. So there it's getting better, for sure. That's how I would see it. Time for a quick break on the show, but we shall return in a minute with Zia Modi, India's top corporate lawyer. Eating up my favorite chocolates because I know chocolates are going to get really expensive. You heard that, right? And it's not just chocolates. We hear that a lot of household commodities are now going to get expensive. As basic as your papad, jaggery, cold drinks, even for that matter, goggles, perfumes, the list just goes on. Commodities are really getting expensive. Why, you may ask? 
Well, the GST Council has sought with states to increase the price rate on 143 items. Out of the 143, 92% of items will be shifted from 18% tax lab to 28% tax lab. In fact, even television and clothing is set to get expensive. Well, this is now looked at a reversal of the rate cuts made in 2017 and 2018, right ahead of the elections in 2019. The Modi government at that point had cut down prices to several commodities. There are four GST slabs, 5%, 12%, 18% and 28%. The 18% slab has 480 items and this accounts for at least 70% of the GST collection. But apart from this, there is some relief. There's a separate list of items for unbranded and unpacked food items that do not attract any taxes there. The council might decide to prune the list further by moving some of the non-food items to a 3% tax lab. But the chances are that this price rise might just happen in phases. Many states have raised concerns about the timing of these proposed changes during the rising inflation. And economics have said higher prices could be due to market influences due to the pandemic. It could also result in a trend of WPI, which is Wholesale Price Index Inflation, collapsing into retail inflation. In fact, the Wholesale Price Index-based inflation surged to about 14.5% in March 2022, while the retail inflation in March surged to a 17-month high of 6.9%. So if you do plan to buy, say, your television set this year soon enough, then my advice is get to it before the GST gets to you. You are watching India. Welcome back. You're watching the Business Today show. I've been in conversation with Zia Modi, co-founder and managing partner of one of India's top legal firms, AZB and Partners. You know, earlier in the discussion, we spoke about private equity. And, you know, you've been at the forefront of many of these deals, which has actually lit up the landscape over the last couple of years. The number of unicorns India has created because of private equity money uh, coming into many of these digital enterprises. I mean, you were in the SoftBank Ola deal as well, uh, personally. But what do you make of this trend? Because, you know, I was speaking to a person you know well, Ronnie Skruwala, you did the Disney UTV deal as well. And he said, you know, private equity can become a, an end in itself. I mean, that becomes the game rather than uh, focusing on the business. Uh, would you sound a word of caution as well, uh, given the kind of valuations which are being drummed up by this private equity infusion in India today? You can't have it both ways, right? You can't say, I want these incredible valuations and then not welcome the person who's going to give them to you. So I think it's a mix between where the promoter wants to draw his or her own line and the private equity that is willing to bet on you. For the young unicorns, the private equity are betting on individuals, on people who will have the energy to turn the value that they give into even higher values. And I think that uh, in today's world where, you know, uh, India is getting a very nice share of the wallet from all the people, from all private equity. Uh, it's really one where there are too few deals and a lot more money chasing those deals. And therefore the value goes up. You take a promoter like Ronnie that has been successful time and again, and has basically been able to create these incredibly valuable institutions and companies. So people are betting on him, right? And the young people that he's working with. So if they give the value, then they expect an exit. And that's the rule of the game, that if you want a value which is great, you give me an exit that is greater. And so that cycle and that merry-go-round goes on. But I think that private equity has proved immensely important and valuable to the country because it has allowed the world to recognize our companies. 
and it has put a value on our companies that didn't exist 10 years ago. So today, when you see our mid-sized companies, not even our necessarily our listed ones, but our young entrepreneurs and our mid-sized companies getting the sort of money that they are getting, that can only be good. And if the exit is something that the private equity asks for, you negotiate it, you get the best deal you can. And then that's the price of the money. I also want to ask you about some of these big deals which are happening in the disinvestment landscape. Uh, I don't know whether you were involved in any of the major mandates which the government recently put out, but Air India got done. And now the government is trying to sell a BPCL. Uh, now, what kind of legal bedrock is important to get these transactions done, uh, Zia, in your eyes? Because, you know, on one hand, you're trying to sell BPCL. On the other hand, the government stops retail prices of fuel being raised in deregulated fuels for a very long period of time leading to huge losses for uh, the existing companies. Do you think some of these kind of legal provisions need to change uh, to be able to attract really quality bidders for some of these government assets? Uh, uh, the basic legal provisions need to be in place. See, I think the government's been pretty smart. So we represented Tata in the Air India deal, right? And ultimately the government, to mm -hmm. my mind, behaved like a private party transacting. So if the entire debt burden would not have been able to be taken over to get a good bid, they dealt with that, right? They dealt with that. When it came to unions and employees, they dealt with that. So I think that uh, the disinvestment arm of the government has figured that for best value, they've got to give an attractive deal. Now, when you're talking about BPCL, if the losses continue and the deregulation uh, and the pricing does not get resolved, the government's just not going to get a good price. Okay, we spoke about many aspects of corporate law and since we were speaking candidly about the public aspects of it, I want to ask you about what, where you stand on this whole controversy which is brewing in Karnataka with the ban of uh, hijab in colleges. Uh, the Karnataka High Court recently upheld one of these rulings. Uh, but if you were part of this case, I mean, what, what would your contention be on something which has struck such a national chord? I don't want to say much about it, except that I think that my personal view is that religion is such a personal aspect of one's daily life. And that to intrude beyond a point is counterproductive. Uh, the ill will that you breed is not as important as the feeling of security that you need in a population of this size, uh, which is, you know, part of us, actually. So... Uh, a much longer debate but it has to be resolved where communities don't feel scared worried leave the country and don't feel part of the motherland so i think that uh, supreme court will resolve it i'm sure okay my last question to you of course is uh, having worked with so many top industrialists over the last couple of decades longer uh, if you had to single out one or two people who really struck you as men of impeccable integrity, people you admire and look up to, who would who would those be? I think quite a few, not one or two. I think that my interactions with Mr. Tata have been fantastic. Not many of them, but fantastic. Always clear-headed and the refrain was always, what is the right thing that we should do? I think that has been the DNA of the group for as long as I can remember. Uh, there are other houses which... Uh, have been absolutely exciting to work for, just in their intellectual brilliance and their execution. Uh, but I would say if I have a fondness for one group, it would be the house. Zia, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much for taking time out today. Most welcome. Thank you. The future fuel in the country is LNG and as compared if suppose the expenditure 100 rupees for diesel, for LNG it comes to 40 rupees and for CNG it comes to 50 rupees. You must have heard of LPG and CNG but the new liquid gold is LNG. Nitin Gadkari echoed similar views by calling it the future fuel of the country. 
The Ministry of Road Transport and Highways will also encourage flexible fuel engines for the future, which can run 100% on bioethanol. His comments when the country is suffering from mounting fuel and CNG prices. So can LNG reduce the burden on the common man? Here's all that you need to know about it. Liquefied natural gas is an odorless, colorless, non-toxic, non-corrosive and non-flammable form of natural gas that's formed when natural gas is cooled to minus 162 degrees Celsius. The cooling process shrinks the volume of the gas 600 times, making it easier and safer to store and ship. In its liquid state, LNG will not ignite. Since 2000, global demand for LNG has grown 140% and now accounts for roughly 10% of the methane consumed worldwide. LNG is a comparatively sustainable fuel. Even though a fossil fuel, natural gas is far cleaner than the solid fuels like coal, wood or liquid fuel like petrol or diesel. And transitioning to LNG will help India in weaning off non-renewable sources of energy. India, the world's fourth largest LNG buyer, currently has six LNG import terminals with a combined capacity of 42.5 million tons per year. LNG imports currently account for about half of India's gas demand. As domestic production is unlikely to keep pace with demand, the share of LNG in meeting demand is likely to expand to 70% by 2030. However, driven by the Russia-Ukraine crisis, LNG prices are set to soar as Russia's move to cut some supply to Europe is poised to further tighten the global market. LNG's price per unit is almost at par with diesel, but it's quieter and cleaner with an emission factor 25% lower than diesel, which makes it a viable alternative. However, because LNG has a more involved production and transportation process, its prices are typically higher than CNG prices. You are watching. Presented by Ebix Cash. Har khushi ke liye kafi hai. Co-presented by Coin DCX. Your gateway to crypto. Hello and welcome you watching India Today. I'm Gaurav Savant. Action packed 30 minutes. Let's get started with the headlines. Patiala tense after clashes between Shiv Sena workers and pro-Khalistan groups. Stones pelted, knives and swords brandished. Curfew 